right. Commissioner Lober, I'll let you discuss your item and then we'll open it for public comments. I appreciate Shh. that. Everybody? Okay, we're reconvening. Okay, so I'm, I'm not going to go through the play-by-play. -play. I think everyone's had the opportunity to review the text. I, I do want to highlight one important difference uh, from where we were when this appeared on January 8th in front of the same body. There was some concerns expressed by one of my colleagues up here that the restrictions as they were applied to hobby breeders were too onerous. Um, working on that and working to try to make the, the proposed ordinance as minimally invasive and as minimally intrusive as possible. There was an expansion in terms of the number of puppies or kittens that could be bred while someone would still be classified as a hobby breeder. Uh, the hope was that that would satisfy the concerns with respect to that and that we'd have more unanimity uh, when, the, when the motion ends up coming up for a vote. So the original number that was included with that was 20. Um, in consultations with uh, the Sheriff's Office, with the Humane Society of the U.S., uh, other groups as well, we decided that a number of 48 would effectively remove any, any particular concerns about a hobby breeder being put out of business. We're not trying in any sense to put out legitimate hobby breeders. Um, we are trying to impact the mills. Uh, I will tell you that looking at reports in terms of the mills, it's arguable there may be some mills that would fall through the cracks uh, or that could argue that they have 48 or less where we have limited ability to police. Um, but within the confines of what's constitutional and in order to accomplish something that is uh, efficacious in, in terms of its ability to largely curtail an industry that's, that's really, it's, it's morally objectionable. Uh, it's, it's something that, that society as a whole has moved toward recognizing is not acceptable um, in any way, shape, or form. We've, we've changed that. Um, by and large, the bulk of the ordinance remains otherwise unchanged. There are some stylistic changes, but we did what we could in reworking it. And again, this is not a unilateral process that took place. This is something that involves Sheriff Ivey, uh, several of his deputies, including um, Joe Hellebrand, who heads animal services, um, HSUS, uh, and other groups. So this is something that we've really made a, a profound effort to... Um, to address the concerns on. Um, I, I will tell you, because it's something that I've received, I, I can't even tell you how many emails um, over the past couple months. There have been all sorts of assertions that there's PETA data or some PETA influence with respect to this. I can tell you, God help me, I included one quotation in the original bill in January that essentially defined what a puppy mill was that I don't think anyone would disagree with. Um, even if you ask a serial killer what one plus one is, they're still going to tell you two and it's still just as accurate. But since I had the, the acronym PETA in there, uh, a lot of people took that to heart and tried to discredit the ordinance because there was something that they probably would agree with, quite frankly, in terms of a definition, but it came from that as a source. So that was taken out as well. Uh, so there's really, there's absolutely no tie-in with PETA. Um, I'm not a PETA member. I've never been a PETA member. I eat PETA chips, but that's about as far as I go when it, when it comes to PETA. Uh, I don't support a lot of what they do. I don't intend to become a member. I don't intend to work with them in any way, shape, or form. Um, I can tell you one of the concerns that was brought up before, and, and as I mentioned just a moment ago to step back, I tried to keep this as narrowly tailored as possible to impact, to the, as narrowly ta tailored as possible such that it would still be able to, to impact the industry in the way that we're attempting to impact it. So one of the arguments that came up when this came out in January 8th was essentially that this is a slippery slope and next we'll have rabbits and we'll have bearded dragons and we'll have sea urchins and then we'll have protozoa or bacteria that have legal protections. Uh, I'm, I'm telling you flat out, um, I've had a number of requests to add other species. My answer has been no. Uh, as long as I'm on the commission, my answer will remain no. It's dogs and cats. It's not dogs and cats and. Uh, so if someone's concerned that I'm going to add some other species or multiple species, uh, I'm, I'm telling you right off the bat, and you can play this as an attack ad if I ever run for something in the future to show that I'm, you know, I'm being dishonest if that's the case. I, I'm not going to do that. So you can use that against me down the road if, if something comes up in the future. It really is dogs and cats. Um, I'm not looking at opening the door for anything. Um, I think something else important to point out is that if you look at the actual text, the way that this is written and the way that the applicable law works, 
if there is a municipality, namely Melbourne, that doesn't agree with what's being accomplished here, there is absolutely nothing on this earth that's going to prevent them from going and saying, look, we're, we're just going to supersede that. And essentially they have what amounts to veto power. So if they don't agree with the decision that the county's making, the individuals impacted in those municipalities can go and challenge this. And if they convince their, their council people, then they'll have it their way. But this will, this will apply uniformly to the entire county unless the municipality uh, in question, if there is one in question, decides that they don't agree with some portion of this. Uh, I can tell you, seeing as how we've had Indian Harbor Beach and West Melbourne enact ordinances that in, in many ways are more stringent than this, um, I, I don't see the likelihood being that those municipalities will ever uh, override this in any way, shape, or form. Um, I can't tell you what the other municipalities do, uh, but this is something where it covers a broad area. Uh, it's, it's going to impact businesses that are sourcing animals in a way that, that, again, is profoundly unethical. This is not something that's going to impact uh, a business that's ethically operating. Uh, if you look at the stats in terms of the largest pet retailers in the U.S., out of the top 20 or 25, I believe only one of them sells kittens or puppies. I'm seeing some folks nod over there. Uh, as, as part of their business model. You know, there are many of them that adopt out animals, and God bless them for doing that, but it's, it's not true that if you disallow folks uh, selling puppy mill dogs that therefore you're, you're relegating them to, to shutter their doors and close their business. It's simply not true. Uh, if they don't change their business model from an animal, animal sales or animal as a commodity uh, uh, option first, then yeah, it's, it's going to be a problem. But we've seen that the biggest retailers have been able to adapt successfully. They sell, uh, they sell everything from leashes to brushes to kibbles to um, shampoo, and they make tons of money. In fact, they're, they're much more successful overall than the shops that focus on selling dogs and cats. So... I've got a slideshow that I'm going to present. Uh, I don't want to keep everyone here uh, any longer than need be, so I'm going to hand it over to public comment, and then I'm going to pick up um, after everyone's done with public comment with a slideshow that addresses some concerns that I think a lot of folks may, uh, may have either been misadvised about or may, may, may misperceive in terms of the, um, the potential ramifications of what this is going to do. Okay. Okay. Um, I just ask that you be succinct with your comments. Um, of course, you have three minutes. You know, you're entitled to use all three of those minutes, but we have 27 cards. So I'm, I'm more concerned about you allowing each other to speak more than I am about us being here. We're used to long meetings. So first is going to be Susan Thibodeau and then William Jacobson. If you could just state your name and address for the record, please, when you get, come up to speak. Susan Thibodeau, 5100 Banana Avenue, Coco. I'm with the Brevard Kennel Club, a group of dog lovers involved in AKC events and the promotion of purebred dogs. Uh, we believe ho in-home hobby breeders, many of us are preservation breeders and we're very active in the sport, uh, have stake, our stakeholders in this, not in a pecuniary way, but we're more concerned about the push to make, uh, push rescue into retail. Uh, we are seeing around the country that as there are becoming less and less adoptable and desirable dogs available in some of our shelters, that rescues and shelters are importing dogs into the county and then we're concerned that the fact that the pet shop can sell a rescue animal, they're already seeing in California where there's a, a similar bill that there's a lawsuit for uh, what they call puppy laundering where some rescue groups are bringing in puppies from puppy mills under the 501C. So what we're concerned about with that is that as they're bringing them in from outside of their local area, we're seeing diseases like rabies, distemper, uh, brucellosis, canine flu, tuberculosis, leptospirosis, and other diseases that are not local to those dogs. Now people in the local dogs are being uh, exposed to those things. Last year, Asian dogs brought in from Korea into the United States from the so-called meat market brought in the canine flu and several people in Brevard County lost dogs and others spent thousands of dollars um, trying to save their dogs from a disease that had been imported by rescue groups. Please understand, we are not opposed to rescue groups. Many of us are very active in rescue. Um, we, we do home visits. We go and get dogs out of the shelters. We rehome them. Um, we're, we're very, very involved. What we want to be sure of, though, is that we're not going to be pushing rescue into the wrong direction with a bill such as this where you tell a pet shop that they can sell a rescue dog. Um, 
that's to us is not the intent you're probably trying to get to, but we want you to be aware of the ramifications of the bill. We're not telling you how to vote. We just want you to consider all the aspects of the bill when you're doing this because we're seeing a lot of things that are making us very uncomfortable. So that's pretty much all I have to say on it. Um, and if you have any questions for me, I'll be sitting out there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. William Jacobson, and after William, we'll have Andrea Shackles. I got a request asking for names of certain breeders. When people purchase can, a Can you give us your name and address? I'm sorry, William Jacobson, 3812 St. Armand Circle, Melbourne, Florida. I got a request asking for names of breeders. When people purchase a puppy from us, they're given the names and the different data. I didn't provide the names uh, upon request for the same reason the USDA doesn't, because people have been harassed and sometimes beyond harassed. And I've been harassed at my store many times, and my employees, and even in my home, when my wife was home dying of cancer. So I'm very against giving out private information to, uh, there's not much difference, it's not a big step between activist to radical to extremist. There was also a concern the last time about, uh, I have USDA reports, no violations in two years for every puppy in my store, including the list that was provided earlier, and they weren't cherry picked. So I'd like to, uh, going back to California, friends of ours uh, that bought a puppy from us, their cousin bought a golden retriever, rehoming is the new keyword. Uh, off of Craigslist um, for $800, 4000 supposed to be eight weeks old, $4,000 later, they had to put it to sleep. And that's, uh, you know, this, this ordinance is going to enhance puppy mills, out-of-hand backyard breeders and hoarders and so forth. It's, it's counterproductive. So I'd like to briefly talk about the power and effectiveness of ads, even deceptive ads, confirmation bias, and a quotation. And I'll jump if I run out of time. Pull the curtain back on the Humane Society of the United States, the ASPCA and PETA. You will find at their core there are radical animal rights vegan groups. So why do they run ads for pitiful dogs and cats? Simply to raise contributions. It would be hard to raise money on a vegan, vegan, uh, vegan platform. So why do they ban the uh, retail pet stores? Because simply they don't believe we should have pets. Uh, we are licensed and inspected by the state and the county. We are bound by the Florida Lemon Law. No other entity mentioned is. No backyard breeder, no rescue, no shelter. So is it logical to ban a regulated entity and open the door wide open for all unregulated breeders? Um, time's marching on. So trying to understand how people could hold this position I ran across something I'd like to briefly go over, confirmation bias. Also called confirmation bias, my side bias. It's a type of cognitive basis and systematic error of inductive reasoning. The effect is stronger for emotionally charged issues and for deeply entrenched beliefs. The explanations for the observed bias include wishful thinking and limited human capacity to process information. Another explanation is that people show confirmation bias because they are wedging Weighing the cost of being wrong rather than investigate in a neutral, objective way. And finally, uh, poor decision, and this is where we are, poor decisions due to these biases have been found in political and organizational context. I think that applies here. Okay, I My have to cut you off now because I gave you an extra 15 or 20 seconds and I don't want to be unfair to somebody else. Commissioner Lober? I just have a very few questions, if I may. Um, in that email you mentioned, uh, or at least that you alluded to, you indicated that you weren't going to provide those names previously. Do you recall having indicated to me that you'd provide those, those names to me in the commission meeting tonight? No. Okay, I, I can pull that up and I will well, before the end of the meeting. The names are available on our paperwork. And no, any I, I, entity is sir, comes sir, to our sir, sir, if you would. I asked you if you recalled having indicated that you'd provide me those names at tonight's meeting. You indicated you, you did not tell me that. Well, if I did, then I misspoke because I certainly, for okay, reasons I, I've already I've got mentioned, a quote I don't want to we'll do We'll address it. later. But no, let me ask, fine. sir, sir, please, I have a few questions. I, I did not interrupt you once, nor would I ever do that to you. What do you define as a hobby breeder? I don't know how to define them, except I know that they're unregulated and they're not required to be inspected by the USDA. Do you buy from hobby breeders? Uh, of all the dogs that I've gotten in months, I think I have one hobby breeder. 
So you, you bought I, at least in one, one instance. I'm not from an comfortable with breeder? it, but I am because of where I sourced, because then I know they come from a breeder of long standing with them. So I'm comfortable with it, but I'm not comfortable with unregulated hobby okay, breeders. Well, I appreciate that. So let, let me ask. Let me ask you. In terms of um, a particular breeder, do you recall having sent an email to all of the commissioners? And if you don't, I can pull it up before the end of tonight, which I will. Uh, do you recall having indicated that you purchased from Marla and Roger Campbell? Yes. Do you know if they have any USDA violations? Yes, but not in the last two years. And I have okay. the current. Thank you, sir. I have two right here. Okay. So don't pull up an old one. Thank you. Okay. Um, I think what we're going to try to do, and if Commission will um, will comply, I mean, obviously you have the right as commissioners, each elected to your own, um, by your own constituents. I think I want to try to reserve questions to the end if possible. Is that okay? I mean, unless it's That's like fine. one question, only because I don't <clears throat> want us to be here all night as, as well as everybody else. So we have Andrea Shackles and Greg Shackles after. And obviously, if we have questions, we can always, if the people are still here, we can always have them come back up if they're willing, if that's okay. That's fair. Okay. Hi. Name and address, please. Andrea Shackles, 2273 Lucy Lane, Melbourne, Florida. Go ahead. Um, I just wanted to share an experience that I had dealt with and am still dealing with. I had purchased a white golden retriever from Puppies Plus in the mall, December of 2010. Um, she was six weeks old at the time, brought her home, brought her to the vet that Saturday to get her checked out. From what they could tell, she was healthy. As time went on, I would bring her for her checkups and her shots and all that good stuff. And I told Dr. Dan at Aloha Pet in Melbourne that she does nothing but go in circles. And he said, well, she's a puppy, you know, she'll grow out of it. By two. Well, by two, she was still doing it. By three, she was still doing it. She's going to be eight years old in October, and all she does is run in circles. I spoke with the vet, because I, I was frustrated. And they said I could give her medication. I said, okay, what would the medication do? Well, she would sleep a lot. I said, okay, sleep how long? In a 24-hour period, how, how long would she sleep? Uh, 18 to 20 hours. I said, well, I have a pet. So my husband and I just deal with her circles. There is something, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a vet. This is just my opinion. There's something neurologically wrong with this dog. I have never in my life seen a dog just do nothing but go in circles. And that's our life. We have this dog that goes in circles. She's the sweetest, most loving dog. She will look you to death. But she goes in circles. And I believe that she was a puppy mill dog. I have the papers at home. If you want to see when I purchased her and all that from the facility. And that's all I have to say. She's a good girl. I wouldn't give her up for the world. But she goes in circles. And that's it. Thank you. Greg Shackles and then Angie Fryers. Okay, bear with me. Name and address, please. Uh, Greg Shackles, 2273 Lucille Lane, Melbourne, Florida, 32935. Thanks. Good evening, commissioners, county attorney, county manager, and staff. I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. I've waited for this evening since my first email to Commissioner Snarty in July of 2017, almost two years ago. I'm a longtime Brevard County resident and voter. It is our time. It is time for our county. It is time for our county, my county, and our county, all these people to follow the other 50-plus cities and counties who have banned the sale of puppy mill puppies in stores. Any store owner who tells you that they do not buy from puppy mills is plain outright lying. They are lying because no good breeder sells to stores. 
No one other than commercial breeders will ship their eight-week-old puppies on vans from Iowa, Missouri, Kansas, Arkansas, and Ohio to the store for profit. We know that for a fact, that the stores in our county buy the majority of their puppies from the states I just listed. These five states are known as the puppy mill states. Both stores use brokers such as Choice Puppies to broker and transport the puppies. This helps to hide from the Department of Agriculture and the consumers from where their puppies originate. Cities and counties have tried for years to figure out a way to regulate sales, but you cannot. Since there's no other source than puppy mills puppies, there is no other thing an option than, to, than the, for a full sales ban. If there was another way to stop puppy mill sales, cities would have been already doing this. Pet stores models are no longer selling puppies. In March 2019, Pet, pet Business reported that out of the top 25 pet retailers in North America, the only one still selling puppies is Petland. The 12th fa fastest growing pet store chain in the U.S. is Wolfgang ba Bakery, and their headquarters is in Ohio. As of 2017, the pet industry is a $72 billion industry, and only 2.1 million of that live is live animal sales. Not just puppies, but all live animals. 2.1 out of 60 billion? It's time for Brevard County pet stores to change their business models and be humane. Commissioner Rishnardi, I thank you and Danielle for listening to me, and listening to me, to my concerns two years ago. I was ill and unable to pursue the ordinance at that time, but as you stated in your email to me, and I quote, it's important to make residents aware that this is not somewhere that they want to buy a pet, unquote. So while it took us two years to get here, better late than never, and I thank you, and I thank you for your support. We want Brevard County to please join the 55 other Florida mini municipalities. And I lost my page three. That is incredible. <laughs> And I did this on TV. But you made the point. This What's that? Made the but point. I think I made my point. And thank you very much. And can I say something personal? Sure. Um, to my beautiful bride, happy first anniversary. Aww. I told you I'd bring you somewhere different, and you've never been here before. <laughs> happy anniversary, Andrea and Greg. All right. Angie Fryers and then Michael Craig. Hi, my name is Angie Fryers. I'm at 1217 White Oak Circle, Melbourne, Florida, 32934. Um, I'm the executive director of the SPCA of Brevard, and I'm speaking tonight on behalf of our organization and Teresa Clifton, who was the executive director of the Brevard Humane Society, who couldn't be here tonight. We jointly offer our support, support for Commissioner Lober's proposal to ban the sale of dogs and cats obtained from commercial breeding facilities, also known as puppy mills, in pet stores located in Brevard County. There are an estimated 10,000 puppy mills in the United States. This includes both licensed and unlicensed facilities, with over 2 million puppies bred in these facilities every year. The conditions in these facilities aren't anything you'd consider acceptable. There is no possible way for local pet stores to individually ins inspect these breeders to ensure that their puppies are breeding parents, are treated humane in a humane manner. Beyond that, the shipping conditions in which these local stores obtain these puppies are also inhumane. They're often too young to be away from their mother, not vaccinated, and can be forced to go up to 12 hours without food or water. Many puppies do not survive, and the ones who do are oftentimes sold to unwitting buyers thinking they're purchasing a healthy animal just for the dog or cat to become critically ill as soon as they arrive home. Animal welfare and sheltering has come a long way in 10 years, but there are still 5,000 animals being killed in shelters around the United States every single day simply because there's no space for them. Obviously, our preference is that the public will adopt from a shelter or breed-specific rescue when looking to bring a new pet into their home. However, we do realize that isn't everyone's opinion and recognize that there can be responsible breeders that adhere to the breed standards and strive to improve their chosen breed at the local level. It has been our experience that those types of breeders are very protective of their puppies and would never allow them to be sold at a pet store. It is our hope that this commission recognizes the ethical duty we have to protect dogs and puppies that are entering our community. We are not here to dispute the animals' care after they arrive to Brevard County, but what's happening for the first eight weeks of their lives and the lives of their parents needs to be addressed. If you look at the trends starting in the southern part of our county and across our country, you will see that the banning of mill dogs in pet stores is on the rise. Brevard County has the opportunity to be a leader in the movement to stop the cruelty that is associated with puppy mills. We hope you vote to ban the sale of these animals in our county. I would also like to address the fact there are folks here from Hillsborough protesting this 
ordinance. As a citizen of Brevard County for the last 20 years, and as someone who runs the largest animal rescue organization in this county, I feel I have a better finger on the pulse of what needs to happen better than a group of people from a county across the state who travels Florida protesting laws like this one. Thank you. Thank you. Michael Craig. And after Mark, Michael, we'll have Courtney Hogan. How are y'all doing? Right. Michael Craig, 498 Mercer Street, Palm Bay. Okay. Um, I just want to address that basically what's going to happen is you're going to have people going out, getting, getting online or the newspaper, looking for puppies. And then they're going to go in unknown places and may be attacked and robbed because they know they're bringing money to buy a puppy. So these people are going to be attacked and you're putting them in danger. It's not right. We have public places to be protected and these people are, are going to be problems. Um, I think partially this is part of a, a monopoly law that you, you mean you cannot make us buy from certain places and people should have a choice where they get their dogs from. Great, you got your poodle from a rescue. Great, I just I, I go with people for uh, um, rescuing dogs. I've had people come to me, ask me, hey, you know somebody might want my dog because I can't take care of it no more. Great, I will. I'll try to find somebody to take your dog. I have no problem with it. I have no problem with rescues, any of them. But you can't stop people from having what they want. You just tell them, hey, no, you can't have that. You got to go here. You got to get a rescue dog. People should have their own choice. I mean, you just can't make them do what you want them to do. They're going to go somewhere and get it. If it's here, in a different county, different state, they want a quality dog they can find. If it's a rescue, great. If it's not, let them have what they want. You can't tell them you can't have this, you can't have that. And it's like telling somebody, hey, no, you can't own a Ford, you've got to buy a Chevy. That ain't right. People should be allowed to have what they want. And I think, it, you know, this, this shouldn't be voted right. I appreciate it and thank all of you. Thank you. Okay, Courtney Hogan, and after Courtney, we have Gwen Burley. Hi, name and address, please. Um, my name is Courtney Hogan. I'm with the Pet Industry Joint Advisory Council, which is at 1615 Duke Street in Alexandria, Virginia. We're here because stores in your county are members of our organization. Okay. Um, I won't take too much of your time because a lot of people have already made the points that I wish to make. Um, we just would respectfully request that you don't advance the ordinance as written. Um, first, I would like to address, you know, you are correct, only about 4% of dogs brought into homes each year come from pet stores. The other 96% come from a variety of sources. But the issue is that, um, first and foremost, an ordinance like this in the county will not stop dogs from coming in from out of your state because people who are looking for a specific dog, and there are a lot of people who for a variety of reasons, whether it be allergy, lifestyle choice, small children, really a variety of things, are looking for a specific breed that cannot always be attained, um, obtained in your state. They go on the internet, like someone said, and they run into a lot of issues. Florida's got a really strict pet warranty law that the stores are required to follow right now. They're required to pay out for veterinary care in the case of a sick animal. Um, <laughs> under this ordinance, you're asking them to vouch for dogs. They have no idea where they're coming from. Um, that's just bad for consumers. It's bad for the business. It really is putting animals and people in Florida at risk. Um, the woman from AKC has already made a great point that, you know, there is a real risk that disease from out of state, out of country even, comes into the county in situations like this. We've seen it in New Hampshire as recently as last week we saw it in Kansas with rabies coming in from other countries that they had no idea was coming because there was uh, what they deemed to be proper paperwork and health information for the animals. <laughs> One in ten pets adopted from shelters, according to the American Humane Society, are returned after six months because they are not a good fit. Right now, people are able to go to pet stores to f see the animal that fits their lifestyle. So it's very possible that an ordinance like this would not decrease the number of animals in your shelters. And PJAC would also just like you to encourage, uh, well, like to encourage Brevard to work with the state. Um, right now, there's no sourcing law on the books for pet stores. Connecticut has it. New Jersey has it. 
And there's nothing right now encouraging or requiring stores to buy from USDA licensed breeders. I would encourage, before you all take this step, I would encourage you to work with the state to get language in place that requires a set of standards for pet stores that sell animals in your state. That would be the first step uh, in looking to solve this puppy mill problem, as everyone has labeled it. There are a lot of unlicensed breeders in the country. But you know, now you can say with, with certainty that the animals coming into your state, into these pet stores, are from licensed entities by the United States Department of Agriculture. Um, I'd like to just use the last 10 seconds to address uh, a question I had about the ordinance itself. Um, I recognize that you changed the number on the hobby breeders. Um, but my question is, a hobby breeder is defined as a person who does not sell dogs to pet stores, and yet they're listed as a resource that pet stores can use. Is that intentional? OK. May I ask that? I'm sorry. If not, no, that's, that's OK. Fine. I can I follow mean, up after the meeting. Are you going to answer it now or later? Sure, I can do it very briefly. OK, time. sure. I'm just, the, like I said, I'm just looking for clarification. The short answer is there have been uh, so many versions that have gone back and forth. It's quite possible that a, a version that's not the version that's up for consideration tonight does, in fact, have some inconsistency. OK. Uh, just one very brief question. Sure. Because I, I, I heard you mention something about the woman from AKC. Do we have any employees or representatives from AKC here? Because I, I didn't think we did. Okay. I'm sorry, that's my mistake. No, no, I, just, I, I thought maybe I was confused. I, I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, and just uh, last word, PJX, happy to work with you guys as you move forward on this process to be a resource to you throughout the process. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. Gwen? Gwen Burley and then Michelle Chapman. Good evening, all. My name is Gwen Burley. I live at 710 Unity Drive, Indian Harbor Beach. Uh, I actually showed up for the retail pet sale ordinance. I didn't come here for the puppy mill project, even though I believe that we need to put that out of business. So to have you stand here and say that you're not adding any other animals without at least having a discussion beforehand, I think is a disservice to the public. Um, rabbits probably qualify for primary consideration. They come from the same cruel conditions. They're a tiny fraction of overall sales in chain pet stores. And I'm not aware of anyone in this county who is supporting a family or feeding a family on retail pet rabbit sales. So clearly a rabbit ordinance uh, would have a minimal impact to retail business and it would be a huge relief to the animal welfare system. Uh, I have a concern about bias in regard to out-of-area input on this ordinance. Uh, an out-of-area lobbyist is apparently invited to participate while warning others about out-of-area opposition. And no one includes information from the rabbit rescues who regularly help out our county by taking the unwanted rabbits from the sheriff's office. Um, I think we need to gather all the information from all the sources, or we need to decide local and act local, one or the other. Uh, I have had a personal experience with this lobbyist, and I strongly object to our county being used to fulfill her objective. Um, I think a retail pet sale ban should be for the benefit of the public in the jurisdiction in which it's enacted. Uh, it should reflect our values for social responsibility. It should protect us from unethical business practices and it should relieve the financial burden for animal welfare. Thank you. Do you have a question? Just real briefly, I just want to point out there was some misinformation in there. I have had the conversation with respect to rabbits. It's not that I've not performed some due diligence. Space Coast Animal Rights, I think, changed their name essentially to make it more rabbit focused. Uh, I can tell you Wayne Ivey, our sheriff, and several other individuals and myself sat in a room with her in my office uh, with um, well, Ashley Sheriff, Burke from, Sheriff Ivey, from I don't believe, for all the good he's done for this county, but I don't believe he should be the last word. He I, sends I, rabbits out of our jurisdiction. Uh, my point is, I just want to correct the statement that I've not listened to the other side. I have listened to the side with respect to rabbits. Uh, it's just not something that's tenable in this ordinance, and I've been very unambiguous that I'm happy to listen to anyone, but there's certain things I support and certain things I don't support. I'm saying you, brought, you are listening to an activist for the puppy mill agenda, but has anybody talked to any of the rescues that take the rabbits from this county? Yes. Have, you have. Which ones? Ma'am, this is not the time for back and forth. You're out of three minutes. Not yet. You, you are. Okay, Michelle Chapman. And after Michelle, 
We have Diane Swap. Good evening. Hi. Am I close enough? <laughs> Yeah. Um, my name is Michelle Chapman and I'm a resident of uh, Winter Garden, Florida. I'm here tonight as a dog lover and as a supporter of the ordinance. I'm also the owner of a chihuahua named Zoe. Zoe was born in a puppy mill in the Midwest and was kept as a female breeder dog for an estimated five years. During this time, she was housed in a dimly, dimly lit building with hundreds of other dogs stacked in cages three high. This was her life 24 hours a day for years. I have no idea how many litters Zoe had, but she was likely bred well beyond what her little body should have ever endured. When Zoe was rescued in 2013, she did not have any obvious physical injuries. However, her psychological scars ran very deep. She was extremely afraid of people, men in particular. When we first adopted Zoe, it took several days before she would even look at us. Whenever my husband or I came near her, she would run away or cower in a corner. She had clearly never experienced socialization or affection of any kind. She would shake uncontrollably when we tried to pet or hold her. It was very hard for Zoe to sleep, sleep, excuse me, sleep soundly, and she would wake up whenever she heard the slightest noise. When she did manage to sleep soundly, she would frequently whimper in her sleep. I can only guess that she was reliving the trauma of her past. Zoe was also very afraid and uncertain of the environment around her. She hated going outside. Zoe was visibly uncomfortable sitting or standing on grass. Being outside made her squint. Her eyes were understandably sensitive after being forced to be indoors for years. Truthfully, Zoe didn't know how to be a dog. She had no interest in toys and did not want to play with her other dogs. All she could do was what came naturally. Hiding, sleeping while sitting upright, and eating her food as quickly as possible. Thankfully, Zoe has learned to trust us. Over the past six years, she has blossomed into a happy, tail-wagging dog. While I'm grateful for Zoe's progress, it saddens me to think of her lost years at the mill and her struggle to feel safe and secure in her home. I, know that, I also know that Zoe's story is not typical. The majority of breeder dogs never get the chance to leave the mill in their lifetime. Establishing a retail ban is not a rogue or radical idea. To the contrary, over 50 localities in Florida and 300 localities across the country have adopted ordinances similar to what Commissioner Loger is proposing. Isn't it time for Bavara County to do the same? And that's not a rhetorical question. On behalf of Zoe and the thousands of breeder mills still in Puppy Mills, thank you very much for your consideration and support. Thank you. <laughs> Diane Swap, and after Diane Swap, we have Diane Haynes. I'm Diane Swap, uh, 627 Flynn Street, Southeast Palm Bay. Um, I have uh, some information towards some of the pet puppy stores in question. Um, I was part of a group that experienced some cruelty. Of, we noticed some puppies outside in 90 degree weather that were not allowed to go inside. A few of us went into the store and talked to the people about it. They said that they rotate them inside. Uh, they had no water, they had no food, they really had no shade. Though on the other side of this, um, this lot was fenced off where they could have had lawn. So um, eventually this store was uh, fined. Um, so, um, but I've noticed that in other stores, if you say, can I see the mother, they won't show you. Um, you say, is this from a puppy mill? Oh, no, 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 not a puppy mill. Um, so I have a few of the reviews from a, one of these puppy stores. Somebody said, we bought our pup from there and got jerked around several times at vet appointments. And they say that they've had to take puppies to the vet, um, a vet recommended by the said store. Um, We've noticed that they're in small cages. Uh, one of the stores that I went into in Vero Beach, 
um, had a Great Dane in a very small cage. Also in the one in West Melbourne, several dogs in small cages on grates. You, I, I said, uh, what about the puppy mills? Do you, do you order from puppy mills? No, they're, they're from out of state, but they're good breeders. Um, an estimated two million puppies are bred in the mills each year, and an estimated $1.2 million are euthanized in shelters. Um, if somebody wants a purebred animal, there is a rescue. There's always a rescue. And when, the, when the, the puppy mills get broken up, the dogs go to the shelters and they're psychologically and physically broken. And this is what this, is what this cause. So, thank you. Thank you. Diane Haynes, and then Barbara Gorin. Good evening, I'm Diana Haynes, 309 North Fist Boulevard in Coco. And this is Bijou. Mm -hmm. Bijou is a product of a puppy mill. Bijou is, had a unique talent that I found out. He's a service dog. He detects my AFib. So he was worth saving. And I adopted him from our local shelter uh, seven years ago. He was actually two pounds when I got him. And he was put out on the adoption floor by mistake, I was told, because he was slated to be euthanized because he was so sick. And I actually had to argue with them to take him. <laughs> and I'm glad I did, because now seven years later, he has no teeth and a lot of problems, but he's still here with us, and he has saved my life more than once. There are a few issues that come before this body that are a matter of life and death, but this is one of them. Animals are conscious beings with rich experiences of the world. They suffer pain, they feel emotion, they build relationships, and they must be considered when making official and ethical decisions about the treatment of them. Just, just as we are in charge of protecting unborn babies, children, the disabled, and the elderly, we are also charged with the representation and the protect, protections of the voiceless, and that is our animals. Humans have an ethical obligation to protect the interests of animals, and cruelty to animals cannot be justified by their level of cognition or communication. These traits are, are relevant to an animal's capacity for suffering. Thousands of animals in this country and this state are subjected to horrible conditions, illness, disease, starvation, mental and physical abuse. These are the voiceless. These are the voiceless victims of the vile and evil puppy mills. Puppy mills are an urgent, widespread problem in this country. We estimate 15,000 puppy mills in the U.S. alone, and these mass production facilities produce 2 million puppies or more. And that number is about the amount that we kill in shelters every year. Everybody talked about the USDA. Well, you can very easily go on the Humane Society page. They're a huge advocate for animals. And they'll tell you about the joke called the USDA. The USDA is so incompetent, it is so screwed up, and it lacks so much funding and in people to actually go out and do these inspections that they actually found in the records that they're allowing these puppy mills to police and inspect themselves and send in their own reports. Now, if that isn't the hen, the fox watching the hen house, I don't know what is. So you really can't put much credence in the USDA. Okay. Supply and demand is what this is all about. I've got to cut you off. I'm so sorry. That's okay. I appreciate, I appreciate you your giving comments, me time. Thank you. All and right. Bijou appreciates it. Barbara Gorin and then Brooke Crawford. Okay. If you decide you want to speak, just uh, Brooke Crawford. And then after Brooke, we have Daniela Coffey. 
Hello, my name is Brooke Crawford. I live at 1121 Juno Place, Melbourne, Florida, 32940 in the Springs of Century. I do not support this pet retail sales ban uh, proposed by Commissioner Lober. I am one of your constituents, and as a constituent, I want the choice of where to purchase a puppy from um, and from a responsible breeder at a reputable pet store. Um, so in the last meeting, it was stated that by and large, um, People in Brevard don't support this legislation, and so I just want to give a voice to those of us who do. Um, and so I would be losing my capability um, to exercise my right as a consumer and where I get my pet from. So I have an emotional support dog that I purchased from a pet store. Uh, her name is Sunny, and um, I needed to purchase a dog who would be small because I live in an apartment, um, one who would be able to go six hours without me as I'm a high school teacher. And so... Um, also, I have an autoimmune disease, and Sunny is a huge support for that and the anxiety that comes with it. So I needed to get a puppy from, like, a very young, from just a couple months old, so that she was trainable, and to help me with my condition, I needed basically, like, breed selection. Like, I needed to make sure that she was small enough for my apartment, that she was easily, temp like, easily trainable, uh, good temperament, things like that. So, um, basically being able to raise Sunny from super well helped me, from super young helped me um, get her to where she is today. So I use this analogy when I talk to my friends about it. Um, as a woman, I'm, there's so many babies that are born in the world, right, that need homes, and we still choose to have our own biological babies. So I use that as like, you know, adopt when you can, and that's amazing. And that's great. And sometimes it just doesn't work in the time that you need. So I think that having this consumer choice would be really great. Um, and I know that Commissioner Kurt Smith um, wasn't going to be able to uh, vote because of his positive experience purchasing from a pet store. And I feel like uh, on the board, I feel like that representation would be like really good and it would be unfair if uh, he wasn't able to vote, even though we have um, commissioners on the board who can vote and have like great um, rescue experience like Commissioner Lover. Um, so yeah, I just would appreciate that. And I mean, as a high school teacher, I always give everyone a voice even if I don't agree with them, you know, so that's just how I feel. Um, so basically, I believe that the issues um, in regards to the lack of Brevard County residents opposing this ordinance roots from a fear of backlash, you know, um, and just from the people who do support it because the people who do support it are great people who don't want dogs from puppy mills being sold, and I don't want that either. Um, and so just basically, I just wanted to commend Commissioner Smith, Smith for speaking out about his purchasing of a pet from a local store, and that's just basically why I'm here today. Uh, my dog has also saved my life in maybe a more figurative sense, but um, all in all, Sunny and I do not port, support this piece of legislation, even if the numbers don't show this in this room today. I know there's many other constituents like myself, um, and so if you have any questions, I'll be here afterwards as well. So thank you so much for being able to speak. Thank you. Thank you. I forgot to start at last. Daniela Coffey, and then after Daniela Coffey, Sarah Ann Conklin. Thank you. Uh, hello, my name is Daniela Coffey. I reside in Hillsborough County. Uh, it was recently brought to my attention that a preemption bill was proposed yet again at the state level. Before I begin, I do want to say that I do believe in local government and I do support home rule. Uh, we attend these meetings to bring fact and logic into this emotionally charged topic. More often than not, those bans were, or these bans were proposed and passed in localities with no existing pet stores. This underhanded tactic was used time and time again to get as many localities to adopt these ordinances without opposition. Intended or not, the ordinance affects more than just this community. Ultimately, if passed, Brevard County will be just number 27 in the animal rights movement. You will be used as a, uh, as a statistic to convince number 68 to pass the same copy-paste ordinance that doesn't benefit the animals. Don't be number 67. This epidemic pushed by animal extremists gained so much traction that the state felt it necessary to intervene. I provided you with the copy of the two preemption bills currently making their way through the state legislature. I am unsure of how this will affect the ordinance on the table, but I can assure you no small business pet stores are seeking to reap the benefits from this unless they are forced to. We support our government and hope you will move forward with the voting on the bill at hand based off the information provided um, previously rather than a fear of this, this proposed uh, preemption bill that may not even pass. Um, or let it sway your decision. Thank you for your time. Thank you. After Sarah, I have somebody who just wrote Crystal. 
from Tampa, Florida. So after Sarah, Crystal from Tampa. I'm Sarah Ann Conkling. I live on South Lake Mount Drive in Cocoa, and I want to commend uh, Commissioner Lober for bringing this ordinance to us and also express my support for the ordinance. I think it's really important um, that we protect animals and animal welfare as best we can. There have been many people tonight who have made the point that people who want a specific animal will do whatever it takes to get that specific animal. And I think we all know that too, that if we ban these sales in Brevard County, people who really want a pet store, whatever, it is will go to another county and and buy that animal from a pet store we can't control all of that but what we can do here in Brevard County is make Brevard County an oasis for the animals that come here. We can take care of the animals in Brevard County. We can encourage people to go to our wonderful shelters where, yes, you can go to a shelter and spend time with the puppy of your choice. They also have puppies. You can get a puppy at a shelter. Every time I go to the shelter, I see puppies, and I want to take about three of them home. So I know they have puppies. Um, they encourage you to spend time with the dog before you adopt it. They actually interview the adopter to make sure it's a good fit. There is a lot of effort that goes on into matching people with dogs in the shelter environment. I've personally witnessed it. So this is not a uh, lack or lackadaisical process in a shelter. You can get a very, very good match of a dog in a shelter. And I think that if we ban these sales and puppy mills, which we should do for animal welfare, the other really good thing that will happen is that people who have never stepped in a shelter and want a dog will now go to a shelter and find out how wonderful they are and what a wonderful dog you can get from a shelter with support from veterinarians and people who care deeply about animals who can give you advice and people you can call when your puppy does the unexpected thing. You get a lot of help from shelters as well. And I also know that our shelter has been a real friend in need during the recession. They actually even help people with pet food. So, I mean, if you're talking about where's the best place to get a dog in Brevard County, it should always be the shelter. I really believe that's true. And um, I support you in doing what you can to just make sure that Brevard County isn't a place where animals are encouraged to be abused on their way to us. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. After Crystal, Jim Erickson. Can we have your full name and address, please? Of course. My name is, <clears throat> sorry, I'm still getting over a cold. My name is Christy Gutierrez. I am from 13705 Northdale Mabry, Tampa, Florida. I just, I believe last time I was up here, I mentioned me getting a dog from online, and it wasn't even delivered to me. I was kind of naive, and they scammed me. So I just wanted to go a little more in depth with that, because if this is passed, then, of course, there are shelters, and before even going online, I tried, um, and took me months to find the dog that I was looking for because I was actually not looking for myself but I was looking for my boyfriend because he's been wanting an Aussie for years and when I found the perfect Aussie and the perfect shelter and I wanted to go see him and try to bond they told me I wasn't 25 so I couldn't even look at the dog that I wanted so that's basically where that ended I couldn't even adopt because I was only 21 at the time so that was out the window, so instead of doing that, I decided, why not go online? Let me see if I can find the perfect dog, not even out, out of state, but maybe in Florida if they're good breeders. Unfortunately, at the time, there were no Aussie breeders that I can go to, no one I can even talk to about that. That was out the window, so option number three, out of state. And I finally found one, and in the end, they kind of just said, yeah, we got the perfect dog. I asked them so many questions. I asked for so many videos. They sent me videos of this beautiful little dog named Sophie. She was perfect, a little angel. I asked them to show me where they bred her, her parents. Literally every question you can ask to make sure that this is not a scam. And in the end, I told them I'd pay half before and then half after the fact. I sent them half. They said, okay, well, you're going to ship her right now. They shipped her. She never came never came. And then when I asked her what was happening, she was like, oh no, she got stuck in the flight. We had to bring her back. I'm still waiting for maybe a return of the money that I gave her and it didn't even happen. So I'm just speaking for those who aren't here. Unfortunately, um, if this does pass, there has to be a place for them to get the puppies that they want. Although there are amazing dogs and rescues and shelters, all the 
options aren't there, unfortunately. Thank you. Thanks. Jim Erickson, and after Jim, we have Katie Sullivan Gratup. I'm Jim Erickson. I live at uh, 3157 Auto Court, in Melbourne, Florida, 32935. Um, I just want to say I, I don't support this ordinance. I, I think the, the problem that we're really aware of is that it exists in puppy mills and the conditions are not good. But why penalize pet store owners who are reputable and then, you know, force us to avoid them, force us to go to shelters that really may not have what people are looking for. Someone just said, you know, you can always find the puppy of your dreams at a shelter. Well, that's not really not true because I have two small dogs. If I go to a shelter, I don't see them. You know, they have pit bulls and they have uh, German shepherds and other large breeds in, in great quantities, but you really can't find what you're looking for. I think this, this ordinance really takes a shotgun approach to really what is a specific problem that I'm not sure this county can specifically address, which is really the conditions in puppy mills in other states. Maybe you need to work with the state level and other states, but I don't know that you're going to be able to fix all the conditions that you, you think you can with this ordinance. Um, it's really just an issue that brings too much collateral damage with the uh, passage of this ordinance, in my opinion. I think uh, it's really an important decision to be made by the county, but I do question why we're, we're trying to make this decision with just three commissioners here, and, and uh, we know how one of them's going to vote. So that's my issue. I would hope that we continue to allow pet stores to sell pets that we would like, um, and that we'd like to have the choice available at that time. Thank you very much. Thanks. And I probably should mention to the public, even if this, this issue passes tonight, it still has to come back to the board. This is just for legislative intent to move forward. I'm not saying whether that's a good or bad thing. I'm just saying it's not set in stone and the commission will be here. And both commissioners, and, and while, you know, we're all human and we all have responsibilities. Commissioner Smith is on a trip um, to DC, you know, basically to work on behalf of the county and Commissioner Tobias on a personal issue. Both had the option to be here or call in and I'm not picking on them for not doing that. I'm just saying if this item wasn't on here for legislative intent, I would probably have asked for it to be tabled, but I am okay possibly with it moving forward only because I know that we will go ahead and address this at a later date with the full commission hopefully, but I just figured out to put that out there for the public. Anyway, Katie Sullivan, Gratup, and Ina Wilson. Hi. Hi. Name um, and address, please. 6441 Barasco, Katie Sullivan, Gratup. Um, Hi, my name's Katie Sullivan Gradup. I'm a resident of Brevard for the last five years. I have two young daughters, and we um, purchased a mini dachshund named Clark, um, December 1st, 2018, from all around the world, Pets in Melbourne. Um, Unbeknownst to me, we purchased the puppy that was very sick. We notified the store within two days of bringing him home. We followed their instructions, which I have in this folder here, um, that stated that we needed to bring him back to them if he was sick, um, that if we went to another vet, that the expenses wouldn't be covered. Um, I felt at that time I was doing business with a reputable company. As we continued down the path, um, I realized that we weren't. Um, what they did is they dragged us along through the process um, so that we were outside the lemon law so that we couldn't collect any of um, our expenses from the puppy. Um, regardless of the money lost, no one, ever, um, no one should ever have to explain to their child on Christmas Eve that their puppy may not um, make it through the night when we're trying to prepare for Santa. Um, my puppy supposedly came from a hobby breeder according to our paperwork. Um, however, um, I feel that any loophole in the law for um, hobby breeders will just be taken advantage of by these people because I know what these people are like. Um, I have prescriptions in my purse for drugs that were given to my dog without ever seeing a vet from the store. Um, we must protect the residents of Brevard from people like this. I met all of these people here because of my experience with the pet store. It's not hard to find people who've had a bad experience. I'm not an animal extremist. Um, I'm just a busy mom who doesn't want another family to have to deal with what we've dealt with. 
Um, it's just happening way too frequently. You can't allow other families to walk in there assuming that they're getting an addi additional family member and walk out of there with a living nightmare. Since December, our, it's been a nightmare with this puppy, and it's hard with children. Um, I did have a choice when I purchased a dog, but seeing, being sold a sick dog shouldn't be an option. My children have been robbed of an experience of a healthy dog and a childhood experience. The gray area will only be taken advantage of by hobby breeders, and that's how I feel. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Ina Wilson and then Christine Parent. Please tell me I said your name correctly. You did. You're okay, one good. of the few. <laughs> um, anyway, good evening. Thanks. Thank you. Um, name and I'm address? Uh, I'm sorry. I'm Ina Wilson. I reside at 1757 Belmont Southwest in Vero Beach. Thank you. 32968. Um, I just want to say I had purchased a, a, a little pep, a pu a puppy um, in August of last year uh, from uh, pets around the world. Um, they didn't give me any kind of documentation. I asked them first where they got these puppies. They said they couldn't tell me. Um, they had, uh, uh, I, I really had no information. But I did, you know, go back the second week and I did buy him. I felt sorry for him because there were four dogs in that and they were stepping on him. He weighed two and a half pounds. Can I tell them to please play the video? Can, uh, can you please p play the video? Sure, SGTV. Puppies getting people sick. We first told you about the health warning on Friday. Bacteria being spread from dogs sold at pet stores. Now News Channel 5's Ryan Hughes learned a local woman is fighting to stop the sale of sick dogs. Come on, Come on. Nicole Capobianco is sounding the alarm and pushing for change in Indian River County. It has to be done because now it is a major health risk to our whole entire community. Nicole now asking county commissioners to pass an ordinance to stop the sale of dogs and cats at pet stores in the county. I had pain. I was nauseated. I, I was miserable. Nicole's fight amplified after our report Friday about Christine Parent, who was hospitalized with severe diarrhea after her mother's dog tested positive for Campylobacter. The CDC saying 118 people in 18 states contracted the bacteria from puppies sold at pet stores. Both Nicole and Christine's mom say they bought a sick dog from Pets Around the World 2 in Vero Beach. I'd like to have some proof that it's here so I can address it. Today, owner Greg Delworthy received this letter from the Florida Department of Health stating he sold a puppy that tested positive for Campylobacter. Doherty would not let us shoot video of the dogs he says he buys from home breeders. He also claims that none of his employees have gotten sick and he feels attacked. We have families that work here. We have kids that depend on this income. Uh, we have uh, orphans that work here. I want to see the ordinance implemented and he can stay open. He can still sell pet supplies. According to the Animal Defense Coalition, more than 50 municipalities in Florida have passed a similar ordinance. Commissioners here in Indian River County tell me they plan to make a formal request in the coming weeks. In Vero Beach, Ryan Hughes, WPTV, News Channel 5. Anyway, that was my daughter. She got Campo from the dog that was sick. He was a terribly sick dog um, for eight weeks. Um, they have a vet down there. I had me come back to her. And she said that all he had was uh, worms and parasites. He wasn't tested for Campo because that's in a very expensive test to begin with. And uh, they don't want to do it. Um, I went to the Board of Health um, to get the lemon law because they didn't. didn't okay. I'm sorry. Oh, I, oh. I don't like to cut people off. Oh, but I, I have to. That's okay. I didn't think about that video going taking up most of the time. But anyway, um, this is my daughter. She can finish up. Thank you. I'll take it. You're Christine. Yes. Great Good evening. Name. I'm Christine Parent. I live in Vero Beach, Florida at 1742 Point West Way. My story is a little bit unique because I am living proof of what a nightmare it has been because I contacted Campylobacter jejuni after taking care of the puppy you just saw in the film. My mother is 77 years old. I'm 52 and I have a son who's 11. The only good thing that has come out of this nightmare is that they did not become ill like I did. My mother purchased this puppy on August 20th. The puppy soiled in the car. 
soiled everything in her home for two weeks. She took the puppy back. She was told by Dr. Debbie Butler that the dog has parasites and worms. The puppy was treated with two different antibiotics. Nothing worked. I presented the first time to Indian River Medical Center in Vero Beach, Florida on August 28th with severe diarrhea and pain. I was not able to provide a stool sample at that time. I went back to the hospital within 24 hours. I was tested and my stool was positive for Campylobacter jejuni. I had no idea what this was. I had no idea what lied ahead of me. On 9-7, I received a call from Chantel at the Indian River County Health Department who notified me of how communicable this disease is, how highly contagious it is, and how she thinks I contracted it. After reviewing all of the information that was available, the epidemiologist at the health department concluded that I had become infected from taking care of the dog and cleaning up the stool. Due to inadequate hand washing, I contracted the Campylobacter. In all, I have been in the hospital six times. This has deeply impacted my life. I'm a mom, I'm a daughter, I'm a nurse, I am many things. But now, everywhere I go, my life is defined as where is the closest bathroom? I am now on a lot of medications which manage abdominal pain, nausea, diarrhea, abdominal cramping. I have over $10,000 of unpaid medical bills that Greg Doherty is responsible for. That dog that my mother bought should have been quarantined and he'll, he, until he was diarrhea free. They knowingly sold my mother a sick puppy and I am living proof of the, the negative consequences that have come from that. I thank you for your time. Thank you. <laughs> Joanne Hall, and then after Joanne, Pedro Hernandez. Name and address, please. I'm Joanne Hall, 1869 Great Falcon Circle, Southwest Vero Beach, Florida. Um, I am an AKC registered breeder, but I choose not to breed as I'm retired from showing Afghan hound dogs. I wish that you would ban the sale of puppies and kittens in pet stores. Uh, I also did have a pet store in Davie, Florida, which I chose to only have inventory, like what you were talking about, merchandise, and I made a very good living at merchandise. I did, on occasion, have exotic birds. Um, I would also say that AKC, if you're going to show your dogs as AKC, with AKC, you have to be a recognized breeder, and also, if anyone's a breeder with AKC, sorry, I'm a little nervous, you have Don't to take an oath that you're not going to sell to a pet store your puppies when you have a litter. Um, this disturbs me, and I hope that you do proceed with the original ban of the sales of puppies or kittens in pet stores, and also um, to include flea markets, because I do know, notice on the way up here, you have a flea market, and I do believe they might have a pet store in it. And um, I won't take any more time of yours. Uh, there was one comment that was made about um, Chinese dogs. And um, I believe how we got, like, this Chinese Sharpay is that a Peter Belmont, who was the top Afghan hound breeder in the country, brought a Chinese Sharpay into this country. And AKC would not get foreign dog breed, breeders, uh, breeds, unless some, they had to start somewhere. So thank you for your time, and I would hope that you would go with the original 
item that you had approved. I'm very nervous speaking. So oh, don't be nervous. He did fine. <laughs> After Pedro, we have Brianna Braun. My name is Pedro Hernandez. Uh, I reside in 13705 North Domebri Highway, Tampa, Florida. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak tonight. I do not support the pet retail sales ban proposed by Commissioner Lober. We are here to provide a source of information that has been silenced and often overlooked. Although the opposition has tried to use intimidation tactics to prevent the truth from prevailing, we are not intimidated. We have a right to speak and an even bigger obligation to the animals to ensure we did not, to ensure we did what we could to protect them. This is our right. We will fight for it and continue to fight for it if necessary. I just wanted to read off a quote from Armando Valadares. Sometimes your freedom is not taken away at gunpoint, but instead it is done one piece of paper at a time. One seemingly meaningless rule at a time, one small silencing at a time. I also want to let you guys know this is not coming from a one-sided individual. I have rescued. I rescued a chihuahua. Love him to death. I had him for three years, and I, I pray that I have him for like four more, five more. Who knows? I also have purchase dogs, and I've had zero issues. I have documentation. I know where they come from. I even Google search where they come from. I did research. I did research. I did my research, and my dogs are good, all of them. And I love, I love all of them. I think everybody should have a choice. I think everybody should have the option. And thank you for your time. Thank you. <laughs> After Brianna, we have Natalie Sanabria. Hello, my name is Brianna Brown. I reside in Hillsborough County. I do not support the ordinance proposed by Commissioner Lober. And last meeting I attended, I provided you with all the news reports on rescues that were neglecting and abusing animals in their care. Commissioner Lober, you stated, quote, there's already a law in the books that's being enforced actively that appears to be working, end quote. This being stated implies that you have no problem with the way that rescues are regulated, which in return means that you really shouldn't have a problem with how breeders are regulated either assuming that they actually are. In one of the news reports I have provided you, the issue is not the charges she faced after the alleged abuse. The issue is that there are no preventative measures to even prevent this from happening. No preventative measures being taken to assure that these animals are being treated humanely in the first place. Breeders have oversight of their operations inquiring and requiring pre-inspection, assuring the facility is safe to hold animals, and unannounced inspections thereafter. So my point is, there is a system in place here. And with this logic of, quote, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, end quote, what is the ordinance addressing that countless other animal welfare laws don't already address? There are so many entities regulating the, this industry, so many preventative measures being taken. There were many concerns in regards to pet resales ban and it being enforceable. Doesn't this issue still rise with rescue organizations? How is this county going to regulate out-of-county sources? You said so yourself, you can't. The only thing we can do is establish a higher standard. You rescues currently don't have any minimal standards of standard of care in place. They don't have federal documents and like the USA reports or health certs, you don't have to review. Because of this, you don't have the option to regulate the quality of the rescue you allow pet stores to work with. The ordinance is aimed to eliminate the county from supporting an abusive industry. How would requiring pet stores to source their animals from, uh, from unregulated sources be better than what's happening now? Animal abuse of any kind is not acceptable. In order for your community to, quote, foster a more humane environment, end quote, the ordinance should protect all animals regardless of the source. The ordinance was drafted looking through rose-colored glasses, assuming every entity is righteous other than pet stores. Thank you. Natalie Sanabria and then Michelle Lazaro. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Natalia Sanabria. I reside in Hillsborough County. Um, I am against this outright ban. It would be leaving consumers with only one option to obtain their future pets from unregulated sources, which I do not believe in. Um, rescue shelters and hobby breeders are not regulated by federal, state, or legislation according to, 
to the Washington Post, rescue groups have spent $2.68 million in donations buying dogs and puppies from auction. This practice is referred to by uh, commercial breeders as a huge underground market. So to add your th to your thought from my last visit, Commissioner Pritchett, there is a whole new monopoly within the rescue industry. You guys are I see in the ordinance, it goes over hobby breeders. They aren't really being, like, it isn't hard to get a hobby breeder license. There isn't really much of an inspection, anything like that. Then I do hear the complaints of the USDA. For years, animal rights groups have taken issue with the number of violations that USDA breeders are getting. However, when the citations are not prevalent, they take issue with this as well. Before there was an improvement in the number of violations, it was stated that there were all puppy mills due to non-compliance with regulation. Now that there are substantially less violations, the, U the USDA supposedly isn't doing their job. For the lack of better words, they are damned if they do and damned if they don't. The proposal from Commissioner Lober takes issue with the USDA's current practices. If you believe in the USDA is the issue, this is not the appropriate way to address it. It should be addressed at the federal level, but if the criteria that have set is not to your liking, how can you turn these businesses over to a source that has no criteria to meet at all? So all in all, I do not agree with this ordinance. Um, if you're going to pass an ordinance, I believe that you should make a higher standard for hobby as well as rescues and other places like that. Um, because since there are really no, there's really nothing for rescue shelters or hobby breeders. So if you're going to take the one thing away that is regulated, like USDA licensed breeders, then I do believe that you should at least form an ordinance that is going to put stricter things on the rescue shelters and hobby breeders. Thank you. After Michelle, we'll have Chris Brown. Good evening. Thank you so much, commissioners, and thank you, Commissioner Lober, for bringing this forward. I am Michelle Lazaro. I am the president of the Animal Defense Coalition. I'm also an elected official in Hallandale Beach, Florida. I'm a city commissioner there. Um, there's so much misinformation going on in this room that I don't know where to start, but let me try. Um, I have helped to spearhead the 50-plus ordinances across the state. Uh, one of the things that were stated that they consistently get wrong is that we had a number of cities and counties that had stores when we passed this ordinance. Sunrise, Florida, Deerfield Beach, Wilton Manors, Palm Beach Gardens, Sarasota County, Oakland Park, just to start naming a few. I'm not going to go through all of them. They all had stores. Some of them had multiple stores considering Palm Beach Gardens had two. Um, I think the most disturbing testimony that I hear now is Christine Wilson. I've been doing this for seven years across the state of Florida. All I wanted to do was pass a silly little ordinance in Hallandale Beach, and I ended up passing 50 and running for office, and now I'm standing here with this shirt on in front of you. This was never any of my intention, but here I am. Christine Wilson is the first time I have ever heard anything in all the years that I'm doing this. 117 cases of Campylobacter in the United States, and we had more than 20 here in the state of Florida. The sad part about the CDC is they won't tell you where these cases are when they happen. So if somebody has a reported case, we don't know what pet store it's coming out of. So now it's not just that puppies are sick, people are getting sick. Somebody mentioned the federal level. We're here today in the local level because the federal government doesn't do it. That's why this was started. We can't keep kicking the can to the state, to the federal. It has to be done right here and enforced right here. If you want to give it to the state, they'll take our preemption, just like they take everything else from us. That's what they're working on. They're not working on standards or regulations. They're working on preemption, and we know how much they love to do that. Uh, consumers have the option. They can go to uh, breed-specific rescues. They can go directly to a home-based breeder. Um, I love the fact when PJAC stands up here and says that you won't know where the dogs are coming from. Well, the store owner, Mr. Jacobson, won't say where his dogs are coming from no matter how many times Commissioner Lober has asked him repeatedly, where do your dogs come from? He won't tell. So I don't understand why PJAC's worried about somebody else not telling. One of the other gentlemen forgot to disclose that he owns the flea market. Um, that they are selling puppies in. So there's a lot of things that are happening in this room that are not factually accurate. What is factually accurate is this is an industry steeped in consumer fraud. 
it starts from the minute that the per, uh, puppies are born in the, in the mills until they get here for sale. Um, I really hope you pass a clean ban. What's in front of you tonight is perfect. Every other open, loopholed ban is never enforced. We've seen it time and time and time again in the state of Florida and elsewhere. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. I'm sorry, he has a question for you. I, I apologize, Ms. Lazar. I just, I, I've been trying to <laughs> refrain from asking anyone anything, but there is a burning question I'd like to ask you. Um, you, you left off talking about loopholes and things of that nature. I, I'm concerned in terms of um, what you mean by that and if there is some particular loophole that you're concerned about or, or what you're referring to with that. Is, is there a particular area of concern that you, you're worried we might pass something that's going to leave open um, leave open a system that might be ripe for abuse? Right, so it's an enforcement issue. Um, if you leave a loophole, I can say that I'm getting my dogs from uh, A, or you know, breeder A, but I can't get on a plane. You can't get on a plane. Sheriff Ivy can't get on a plane. Nobody can get on a plane, and even if they could get on the plane to go to Iowa, Kansas, which we've done our research, HSUS is behind, we, we've pulled the certificates from these stores. Iowa, Kansas, uh, uh, Missouri, you can't get on a plane and go there and see these breeders. And that's what these stores are doing. They're using these loopholes to continue to buy from these breeders because they're the only ones that will sell to stores. And when you say a loophole, are you talking about an exemption or? Yeah, the exemption for a hobby breeder. Any kind of exemption that allows a breeder to sell to a store. Are, are you concerned that, that uh, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, I don't want to do that to anyone. But are you concerned that folks out of state are simply just going to say, oh, yeah, I'm a hobby breeder? And, I have and now we have documents, Commissioner, where we've seen them actually write hobby breeder on their CVIs, on their certificates from the state of origin. They write hobby breeder instead of their USDA license, and they come over and they sell right here in Florida. We've seen it time and again. They lie. They're, they're calling themselves hobby breeders when they have 150 puppies on the property. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Chris Brown. Hi. Chris Brown, Merritt Island, Florida. And I just wanted to thank uh, Commissioner Lober for bringing this to Brevard County. It's about time we, we got something going here. It may not answer or solve all the issues and problems, but it is a start. We've heard a lot of ill stories here about the puppy mill dogs, owners that are experiencing expense, upset, Etc. And as a volunteer for a pet rescue for the last 10 years, I can attest as well. Dogs we've gotten are nervous, afraid, have never touched grass, have uh, back problems, injuries from being in cages, and it just goes on and on. And I appreciate that we're trying to at least start something here in Brevard County. Thank you. Thank you. Alexandra Drea Julian, and after Alexandria, Judy Fialco. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Alexandria Julian. Hillsborough County is where I reside. Um, touch on a few things here. One, um, anyone who states in this room today that um, a responsible breeder would not sell to a pet store is providing you with false information. Um, I know this firsthand with the experience with my breeders. We've gone over this in the last meeting, so I'm not going to touch on that too much. Um, two, um, we come strictly, everybody over here, anybody from Hillsborough actually, um, we come strictly as a source, um, just for something for your community so that you have a way to get the information that you otherwise would not have been provided. Um, three, um, asking a business owner to convert to a supply and service model will result in the closing of that business. This business owner and any other business owners in general that are currently, um, uh, that would have to abide by this ordinance, um, cannot compete with corporations like Petco or PetSmart. Um, inevitably, they, they will go out of business. Um, I provided you, actually, if one of you guys can grab it, Cornell University study. Um, that just goes over um, that... There is no difference in health amongst dogs obtained from rescue shelters, hobby breeders, or pet stores um, as far as um, upper respiratory infections or um, uh, parasites. I believe there's more parasites prevalent in shelters, and then there's more um, uh, upper respiratory um, 
more prevalent in pet stores. Um, Finally, the part that I'm more, um, most passionate about would be the breeders. Um, there are so many reputable breeders that far supersede the unreputable. Um, unfortunately, they get falsely labeled as puppy mills, and then they end up being victims of this type of legislation. Um, uh, actually, that's not finally. Um, in regards to the ordinance that, um, ordinances that have passed in places with pet stores, um, my family is actually going to be working on an email to get that over to your office that goes over um, the list of municipalities that have banned pet stores that are actually currently in litigation um, with their county or city or whatever. Um, in regards to loopholes in this ordinance, there are many. Um, what preventative measures are we going to be taking to make sure that all of these different sources, since they are all unregulated, um, what, what efforts are we going to be making to make sure that those dogs that are going to be sourced to this pet store owner or pet store owners, um, what are we doing to make sure that they're not coming from unreputable places? Um, no rescues are being inspected. None of these hobby breeders are being inspected. And exactly like she had just said, how are we going to um, go through documents and say, oh, this isn't this person or um, this person actually um, isn't a hobby breeder or this is somebody else? Um, there's nothing on the books right now that would help with that regulation. So I'm concerned about that. Um, I would also like to say thank you for considering everything that we've said um, and even letting us speak. Um, and I really, really hope that you guys make the right decision because I want this to go in the right direction for the animals, nobody else. Thanks. Judy. Oh, cool. Thank okay. You. Thanks. Bielka. And then Holly Gann. Hi, I'm Judy Fialco. I live at 120 Plover Lane in Rockledge. Um, I have been a Brevard County resident for six years. One thing that I'd like to ask all of you is to give a little more weight to the testimony you've heard from Brevard County residents instead of out of area lobbyists. Um, I have a story very similar to what you've heard before. About 12 years ago, I wanted to purchase a puppy for my daughter who was graduating high school. I thought at that time the best thing to do would be to go to what I thought was a reputable pet store in a mall in Cleveland, Ohio. I did that. I pur purchased a little Papillon puppy. He came from a breeder in um, Holmes County in Amish country, and I thought that, that oh, isn't that wonderful, a little Amish dog, because I didn't know about the puppy mills. A really good sign right away, if you've ever seen a Papillon, they have big curled tails that curl over their back. His tail was broken in half at a right angle from being in a small cage for so long. Um, probably about six to eight months after we got him, he developed a lot of health issues. Um, he had pancreatitis. I spent thousands and thousands of dollars on his health care. And unfortunately, not sh shortly after we moved down here, um, we had to put him down. It just it was something that was incurable. So it's just something similar to what you've heard from other people tonight. I do want to address two comments that people have made tonight night saying that um, they want to get a dog from a reputable breeder through a pet store. Reputable breeders would never sell to a pet store. A reputable breeder wants to meet the potential owner, find out what type of family the dog is going to, and that it's going to a safe environment. So that's one other thing to think about. Someone else mentioned um, that you can't get a small dog from a rescue or a shelter. I volunteer for a group called Polka Dogs that's in um, Winter Garden, Florida. The only thing they rescue are tiny dogs. They have chihuahuas, they have shih tzus, they have tiny terriers, Jack Russells. You can get any type of purebred dog you want on Pet Finder or for really researching any type of shelter in your area. So I just want to bring those points to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Holly gone, and after Holly, Larry, Danny. Hi, I'm Holly Gann, 611 Pennsylvania Avenue, uh, Washington, D.C. I'm with the Animal Wellness Foundation. I'm excited to be here today because uh, it's actually not my first time commenting in front of the commission. Uh, I now work in Washington, D.C., but I was born and raised here in Brevard County, and a few years ago, uh, I was up here talking to the commission about some other animal welfare issues impacting the county. And I'm here today in support of Commissioner Loeber's uh, proposal 
to prevent the sale of puppy mill dogs in pet stores. And I want to say that I'm so very glad that you all are considering this proposal. Uh, the ordinance would go a long way to help improve the welfare of dogs in Brevard County and follow suit with 60 other localities across Florida and nearly 300 across the country that have adopted similar legislation. Uh, without a doubt, this is an important issue for Brevard County. Allowing the sale of puppy mill dogs only contributes to the number of dogs that ultimately wind up in shelters and pre presents a tremendous burden to the taxpayers and harms the welfare of these dogs. Passing this ordinance would also ensure that Brevard County does not contribute to the cruelty of puppy mills. Uh, puppy mills are uh, dog breeding operations that breed dogs in filth and misery. Uh, the dogs, the mother dogs, uh, spend their entire lives kept in very small cages where they can barely turn around. They suffer horrific, painful injuries such as perforated eyes, leg injuries, open wounds, injuries to the reproductive systems, the list goes on. Veterinary care is unthinkable because that would cut into profit margins. This is the entire life of a mother dog uh, kept in a puppy mill. Uh, these mother dogs must wonder what they have done so wrong to end up in a life of such extreme misery. Meanwhile, we have dogs sitting in shelters right here in Brevard County, and dogs throughout the state are being euthanized in appalling numbers. I think we can do much better than this. Uh, protecting animals from cruelty, it's an important value to the people of Florida, Democrats and Republicans alike. It's an issue we can all get behind, and actually it's my Florida roots that led me to pursue a career in animal protection. Uh, we've had a few people here today mention concerns about consumer choice. Uh, I just wanted to make a note that uh, I don't see how that would be impacted uh, because there are responsible breeders, there are breed-specific rescues, many rescues and shelters that are available where uh, you can find just about any type of dog. So I will close here uh, just by saying that I hope you all will uh, vote to ultimately pass Commissioner Lober's proposal and you know, I'll just say that we can sit here all day and throw all these facts and figures in your direction, but ultimately it just comes down to doing the right thing. And I want to be able to say that I'm pr very proud of Brevard County, and I believe that I will. So thank you. Thank you so much for coming out to speak, and welcome back to Brevard. What part of Brevard were you from? Uh, Merritt Island, that's actually. In my, that's in my so, district, excellent. Thank you so much. So I, I just got, I, I've got one question for you, and it's, it's essentially the same question that I asked Ms. Lazarow earlier. Um, obviously, in the position that I, I presume you have, being in D.C. And, and working for your employer, um, you're much, much better versed than I ever hoped to be on this particular issue. Uh, that said, do you have the same concerns that she has uh, with respect to having hobby breeders permitted to sell to retail? Because I'll, I'll tell you right now, I'm of the opinion that we should not do anything, and I know there's a hobby breeder, or a, uh, I guess, is that a proper term, ma'am? Yes, okay, there's a hobby breeder here. I don't want to impact her ability to sell dogs um, or, or um, make money from doing that. Um, I'm talking specifically out about hobby breeders selling to retailers. Do you have any concerns about that? And if so, could you speci uh, specifically lay out what those concerns might be? Yeah, I would, I would absolutely have concerns about that. I would say that... Uh, specifically, I think it's a way to get around what's the what's the intent here, uh, which is to uh, you know prevent the sale of uh, puppy mill dogs and in pet stores and you know uh, some of these hobby breeder uh, a hobby breeder exemption. Uh, you can have someone that's still breeding these large number of dogs uh, and conditions that are uh, still problematic. Were we to allow a, an exemption like that where we permit them to sell to retail, do you know of any, because I, I don't, I'll just put it out there, do you know of any mechanism by which we in Brevard County or our sheriff's office would be able to go and police out of state? I'm just not aware of one. Maybe, maybe you've heard of some way for us to verify out of state claims in terms of numbers of dog, be, dogs being bred or hobby breeder status or, or anything along those lines. Is there something uh, that occurs to you? Yeah, I think there would be issues there uh, with jurisdiction, absolutely. And you can just have these individuals from out of state that are essentially just puppy mills. But you know, calling saying themselves hobby breeders? Hobby breeders, exactly. All right, That's I appreciate it. Problem. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you so much. Thanks, Larry. <laughs> Danny. And after Larry, we have Jenna Jensen. Hello, Commissioners. I'm Larry Davis, and I live at... Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I said Dennis, I think. I, you or did, Danny. but that's okay. 
I live at 35, 36 Swallow Drive in Melbourne. Um, only lived, I've only been a resident for Florida for three years. But uh, I just wondered why in the world would the commission take action that would enhance the black market puppies in unregulated puppy sales? I, you know, I, before, I did, before I moved here, I worked for the Better Business Bureau in northern Colorado. And I would approve 401Cs when they would try to get um, uh, accredited from the Better Business Bureau. And there were some strict rules that over, I think it was 72% of the profits had to go to the particular charity that they were trying to get accredited. And believe me, you go through paperwork that was this thick and nobody was happy about doing it. But uh, in that job, I did, I did manage to look at a lot of the um, charities that were around, and one sort of caught my eye because I used to hear this Sarah McLaughlin commercial where she would sing, and they'd show dogs in cages and how sad it was, and you know, it'd pull your heartstrings because we all love pets. I don't think there's anybody that doesn't love dogs and cats. But you would watch this commercial and you'd say, oh my God, $19 a month, you know. But anyway, I looked into it, and it was less than 5% of the money actually went to the actual dogs and cats, that it was all going into people's pockets. But it's, it's such an easy thing, you know, you, to, to get people's hearts. And it's just an easy thing to fall into a trap. Also knew a woman in uh, northern Colorado, and she adopted a child from Russia. And she said, I actually knew her personally. She was a wonderful woman. They wanted a child. They got one from Russia, finally. She ended up murdering that child after five years because she just, the kid was one of these children that was put in and absolutely had no human contact through all its life as a young child. And it was so hard to manage this child that she ended up drowning it in a bathtub, which sounded unbelievable. Well, everybody's going to have a bad experience. It could be children, it could be animals, something happens, and uh, it's easy to bring up an example. I'm just saying it happens in life, no matter what industry you're in. But I just had so many good pet stores back in northern Colorado before they banned the stores from selling, selling anything that we had never had complaints on and only had uh, good remarks from. And uh, what happened is it just proliferated where you, all you could see is Craigslist went like 40 pages of, of ads from puppy mills. So it just created a bigger problem than they had before. But I thank you. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you. And you all. Thank you, sir. Jenna Jensen. Good evening, Commissioners. My name is Jenna. I live in Washington, D.C., and I'm here as a part of the Humane Society of the United States, and I work on the Stop Puppy Mills campaign. I was asked to be here today as an expert on the puppy mill to pet store issue. Um, and I would like to address quite a few things that have come up today, um, particularly the internet. Um, I just would like to point out that anyone that sells over the internet has to have a license just as anyone who sells to a pet store. They also have to adhere to the standards of care under the Animal Welfare Act. In addition to that, we've mentioned today that 2% of puppies are obtained from pet stores. That means that 98% of people are getting their dogs elsewhere. So to say that this is going to create a surplus of people going to the internet is simply untrue. Additionally, to say that a pet store can't convert to a humane model, um, HSUS has actually helped convert 21 pet stores to a humane model, and they now work with shelters and rescues. Uh, recently, Super Pet in Tampa used to obtain dogs from commercial breeders, and now they obtain dogs from shelters and rescues because they said themselves that they've lost consumers um, because consumers didn't want to shop at their store and support the puppy mill issue. Um, additionally, I just would like to point out that this ordinance has been challenged and upheld six times in federal district court and once in Florida state court. So this has been settled legally um, in the state. 
And um, in terms of responsible breeders, here's a fact. Um, we reviewed codes of ethics, ethics for the national breed clubs representing all 178 dog breeds recognized by the AKC and found that 96% of those dog breed clubs include in their statements that they do not and or should not sell to pet stores. Pet stores claim to only purchase their puppies from USDA licensed breeders. However, the USDA itself states that it does not certify establishments and that a USD license is not a seal of approval. A um, breeder has to, who has a USDA license has to abide by abysmal survival standards. A dog can live its entire life in a cage just six inches larger than its body with little to no exercise, socialization, or veterinary care. Um, to make matters worse, the USDA is currently protecting animal abusers um, by redacting pertinent information on animal welfare reports. Um, so here's an old report of a dealer who supplies to Puppies Plus. If I were to request this from the USDA today, it would look like this. This leaves consumers and law enforcement in the dark about what breeders are being compliant or non-compliant under the Animal Welfare Act. It's absolutely horrifying. Um, and um, I provided you all with a report that shows you and tells you the truth about where these pet stores in Brevard County are getting their dogs. Um, one of the dealers in that report has been in our horrible 100 puppy mill report four different times. They've been, um, they've received a complaint from the USDA. They've received a fine for eight grand. Um, another dealer supplying to um, the pet store in this county. Um, finish this really quick sentence please. Um, a sentence? Yes. Um, so the other dealer supplying to the store, which is also, it's Choice Puppies, but it's formerly known as the Hunt Corporation, and they were cited by the Missouri Department of Natural Resources for burying a thousand, thousand pounds of dead puppies per okay. year. Okay. you have questions? And I, I'm going to touch on the same topic, because again, it's, it's my, my biggest concern at this point. Um, do you have any thoughts on that same topic that we've addressed with respect to the, the hobby breeder exemption permitting them to allow uh, or permitting them to, to engage in retail sales as opposed to selling to individuals out of their home? So we have no problem with hobby breeders selling directly to consumers. That's how they sell anyways. Um, and I agree with the statements that were already being made about how you know state officials in this state have no authority to inspect a breeder in another state. And to provide an example of this, um, there was a breeder in Arkansas with 295 dogs that should have had a USDA license but did not. And she was selling online and to pet stores as a hobby breeder. And she can evade that because that pet store on the East Coast is not going to go inspect a breeder in Arkansas. If, if you'd be so kind, just the last item. Uh, with respect to that, that statistic you gave toward the end of, of your three minutes, you said there were dogs that were, I guess, what was, what was the story with the dogs that died in... in, in so Choice Puppies, yeah. formerly known as the Hunt Corporation, was cited by the Missouri Department of Ag for burying 1,000 pounds of dead puppies per year. And that's, that ties to Brevard in, in what way? Um, because uh, pet store in this room and in this county is sourcing from that broker. Okay, when you say pet store in this room, I'm only aware of one pet store that's in the room. Are you aware of another? No. I appreciate it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's all the cards that we have, so I'll turn it over to Commissioner Lober. Okay, if we could get uh, SGTV to put on that slideshow, please. And bear with me, because I, I just don't have the vision to see that. I'm going to look at some, uh, some docs here that are identical. So let's get started here. And I'm going to move as quickly as I can through this. I'm not going to uh, focus too long on each and every slide in the interest of time. So I, I took out some items, because I, I think one of the important things that Mr. Jacobson was right about is it's important that we do not have a knee-jerk reaction and we do not do anything impulsively. Uh, along these lines or that would pertain to this particular proposed ordinance. So I, I've, I've listened to that advice and I, I took it to heart. And to that end, I've taken some quotes, uh, mostly from Mr. Jacobson or, or perhaps all from Mr. Jacobson, uh, from that first meeting in which this was addressed. And these are verbatim out of the minutes that were approved by this body from January 8th. So I want to address a few things. Um, in no particular order, there were claims made that AKC and USDA are, are essentially safeguards with respect to these out-of-state breeders. I want to I want to touch on them uh, touch on them one at a time. Let's let's look first at the AKC claims. Uh, Mr. Jacobson said his store is approved by the American Kennel Club, and this is verbatim out of the minutes. His store is approved by the American Kennel Club and sanctioned by the AKC. 
Uh, he also went and he said that the AKC does not sanction his store as an AKC pet store, again, as an AKC pet store for getting the puppies from Bubba and Earl. Moving on, I asked how it was that the AKC sanctions his particular store and what he means by being sanctioned by the AKC. He stated in response, again, according to the minutes, it's not me paraphrasing anything, that they recognize, the AKC that is, they recognize and are trying to support the legitimate pet industry. They went to and inspected different stores and based on their history, their knowledge, and the knowledge of the breeders they deal with, they decide who to support. I asked what the specific criteria were that AKC looks to verify, and in response he stated they're looking for cleanliness, a credible relationship with a veterinarian clinic. I'm going to move actually, let me take this one first. There's a, uh, an online review on uh, Google's, uh, Google uh, regarding Mr. Jacobson's store Puppies Plus, and I'm, I'm not concerned about the content of the review, I'm more concerned with his response. He indicated our prices are far below show dog prices, which suggests to me that's why we can't have legitimate breeders selling to this individual because the pricing structure doesn't support it. But more importantly, and the point I'm, I'm focused on here is he indicated he's, quote, authorized by the AKC. So let's go back here. So Corrine Williams, who is another hobby breeder, and she said she's an AKC breeder of merit, came by on January 8th, and she stated, and again, this is straight out of the minutes, that the AKC does not license breeders. Everything she's saying is on the AKC website, and as an AKC breeder of merit, it does not mean much. This coming from an AKC breeder of merit, only that she registers her puppies with the AKC. Talked about that. I stated, and the board heard, that there's not much involved in having an AKC certification, and they don't license breeders. I didn't know at the time whether that was correct or not, so I, I didn't want to do anything impulsively. I didn't want to have a knee-jerk reaction, and thank God I didn't. This is straight off the AKC's website, and it's on there now. AKC is not affiliated with and does not license or endorse any breeders, groomers, or other service providers, including those listed on the AKC marketplace. AKC has no control over their business practices, and they're not liable for any dealings between you and any breeders, groomers, or other service providers. Sounds pretty clear. But... Let's give everyone the benefit of the doubt here. Also on the AKC website, it says the AKC does not sell dogs and makes no warranty or guarantee as to the health, quality, parentage, or value of any dogs. And AKC registration does not indicate the health, quality, or value of a dog. So I, I thought, you know, maybe I'm just misunderstanding simple English here. Maybe, maybe I'm not getting this right. So I'll write to the AKC and make sure that my understanding is really uh, something that matches reality. So I wrote to them in part, please inform me whether there is any truth to the shop owner's claims as to the level of involvement AKC has had with his shop, including one, having approved his store, two, having sanctioned his store as a, quote, an AKC pet store, three, having recognized the store goes, quote, above and beyond the, on the lemon laws. Um, I don't know why I said three again. I guess I had a typo in the original email. And three again, having inspected his store for cleanliness and a credible relationship with a veterinarian clinic, as these claims appear to be incompatible with the disclaimer that I've quoted from your website. And I, I included that disclaimer that I, I read to you all in the email to AKC. They got back to me and they said, in pertinent part, it is correct that the AKC does not license, endorse, or recommend any breeders, kennels, or pet stores. It's about as clear cut as it gets. So let's address the other claim, USDA, and them being the, the other safeguard here. And all of these I've indicated the source. In 2010, the USDA audited itself, and the In Office of Inspector General released a report stating that the enforcement process, again, this is coming from the USDA, that the enforcement process was ineffective against problem dealers. Inspectors did not cite or document violations properly as needed to support enforcement actions. Penalties were minimal, and inspectors were allowed, uh, pardon me, and inspectors allowed facilities to operate unimpeded year after year despite repeated violations. Photos in the report show horrific cruelty. This is from the USDA. Recent data indicates this problem remains. And now, you may not believe this. I'll tell you, I'm an attorney. I pulled the actual US code, and I'll show you in a minute that this is absolutely accurate. A USDA licensed facility may legally, one, confine dogs in cages only six 
inches larger than their bodies for their entire lives. And it's worse than that sounds. I'm going to show you in a minute. I have a USDA graphic I'm going to show you. It's really much worse than it sounds, and it sounds pretty bad. They're allowed to provide only coated wire flooring in cages. They're allowed to deny dogs adequate exercise and socialization, all permissible under the Animal Welfare Act. They can keep dogs in frigid or sweltering temperatures for up to four hours. We've heard, we've heard from an individual earlier that they had dogs at a particular shop. Um, out, I guess puppies out for a period of hours in the sun. They're also allowed, and again totally permissible under the USDA, to breed dogs repeatedly and excessively without any limit whatsoever, and they also don't have to provide any regular veterinary care beyond an annual walk through the facility. Now let's go to, to look at the actual, the law. Um, this is out of the Code of Federal Regulations. I've got the citation at the top and a better citation at the base. I took uh, a graphic that they had and I, I deleted the portions that don't apply to the measurement uh, length, lengthwise for an animal because this is, this is the relevant item. I, I think just it's almost hard to, to fathom unless you see this. When they measure the length of a cage for compliance with the Animal Welfare Act, they're calculating it from the tip of the nose to the base of the tail. That might be, and I don't even think it would be, that might be okay for a teacup dog. But for a mountain dog, or a lab, or a uh, Malinois, or anything that's a sizable animal, you could, you could easily have it such that the dog's tail, if it's extended, wouldn't fit in the cage, and that cage is compliant per the USDA. That is disgusting to me. So I want to talk about some claims that Mr. Jacobson meant, uh, sent to the commissioners. Uh, We've gotten quite a few emails. I couldn't even fathom a guess as to how many, but um, I'm going to quote him directly. I don't want to misstate anything. So he sent an email to Christina Znardi that we were copied on on January 9th, 2019, uh, indicating, and I'm quoting him, this is the process our pups go through before they're made available for sale. And the very first item in his list is all breeders are USDA licensed breeders with, that's right, no violations. And we heard even from Mr. Campbell during this very meeting that, oh yeah, um, I'm sorry, Mr. Jacobson, that yes, I purchased from the Campbells. Oh, and they, they have violations, but yeah, it's from two years ago. So that's, that's objectively false. Let's look at another one. He goes in a, an email of January 15th was the date to all five commissioners, and in pertinent part he says, quote, our source will not accept puppies from any breeder that has a USDA violation. That is fundamental. According to, to what he said here, that's absolutely not true. Let's talk about Marla Campbell and Roger Campbell from Kansas. He said in an email to all five commissioners, also from January 15th, our source does not, I'm sorry, our source does, they do, our source does purchase puppies from this breeder and therefore so do we. Since he specifically identified and called attention to this one particular breeder, they ought to be pillars of the industry, right? Mr. Jacobson stated, that the USDA began withholding providing names of breeders to those who don't have a need to know as breeders have been harassed. He indicated that to me in an email on March 18th. Uh, as a result, many of the records are older than what I would like to show you all because the breeder names have been withheld. I'll just, I'll read you the pertinent parts here. There's a portion underlined in red and it may not be terribly well visible there. This is the, the Campbells who he indicated this evening and who he indicated in writing he buys from. This is the state of Kansas Department of Agriculture. Um, it's a final order, it's a consent agreement where it indicates the original civil penalty was $6,500 uh, for violations there. In the interest of time, I'm gonna skip a little bit of this, but not, not exactly an above board breeder. Let's, let's focus on something else here. I wanna talk about the USDA because that was what he claimed, um, essentially serves as a net uh, to paraphrase. So this is the USDA uh, filing a complaint, essentially suing these individuals for violating the Animal Welfare Act. And he's indicated he's bought from them, or I, I suppose continues to buy from them maybe. Uh, it talks about failing to provide the USDA, and this is the portion that's highlighted, with access for inspection, failing to have a responsible adult available, uh, failed to keep maintain accurate records, uh, failed to provide adequate veterinary care to the animals, failed to establish and maintain programs of adequate veterinary care that include appropriate methods to prevent, control, diagnose, uh, diagnose and treat injuries or diseases. It goes on, 
and I'm going to give you, I'm just going to go through some of these, and this, this will take a moment, but I promise you it's well worth it. Uh, the first item here, A, talks about them having found the USDA a female basset hound with no ID that was observed to have a cloudy red and enlarged right eye with discharge on the skin. Same date, they found a male pug limping and holding the left rear leg up as he walked. Uh, later, same year, they found a female dachshund which had hair loss on the face and the area with the hair loss was moist with a creamy discharge. Same date. A female basset hound with no ID observed to be squinting and had a cloudy pink left eye with discharge around the eyelids. Same date, a Jack Russell Terrier had hair loss on her face and the exposed skin was pink and scabby and she had also uh, dark debris coating several upper right teeth and a red gum line and cheek with white discharge. Same year later in the year, a miniature Australian Shepherd with no ID which, uh, which had a heavy coating of dark brown matter. Uh, on his cheek teeth on both sides of his mouth extending into the gum line. The gums were red and inflamed with a creamy white discharge at the gum line and one tooth on the right side was loose. Same date. Again, all in the same year. Uh, Jack Russell Terrier with a red, moist, hairless open wound on the right side of her upper, uh, upper neck and cheek area and she had not received medical, uh, veterinary medical care. Goes on a um, subsequent year. An adult dachshund had a thick buildup of tartar on his premolar and molar teeth. The gums over the teeth were red and receded away from the teeth. There was a creamy discharge at the gum line. Uh, it talks about some teeth and one uh, loose upper incisor tooth. Uh, same date in that year, an adult female black French bulldog diagnosed with a skin condition, I believe is what that is, a keratitis. Uh, and it indicates that the attending veterinarian prescribed treatment, but the respondents, namely the folks that he buys from, failed to follow the treatment plan and the dog's left eye was red and had a thick green colored discharge on the cornea and a hazy appearance. It, it goes on and on and on and on. Um, it talks about dry cake fecal residue and other debris on the cement flooring affecting four dogs. Talks about failing to maintain surfaces, uh, specifically the carpet square and the three enclosures, affecting dogs and puppies. Talks about exposed metal flooring in one enclosure. Talks about uh, buildup of dried mud on 10 shelters in the outdoor housing facility. Shelters housing multiple boxer dogs that were not as tall as the dog. So again, the dog can't even stand up in them. Uh, it, go it just goes on and on and on. So he's, certainly Mr. Jacobson, when he came here in, in January, wanted us to believe he was open and honest. And I got to tell you, I bought that myself. I, I did not want to shut him down come January. I really did not, because I thought he's just a good guy trying to do what he can do. But let's talk about whether he's really open and honest. I would like to, and this is, I'm quoting him, I would like to set up a meeting with Vice Chairman Brian Lober or any of the commissioners or staff, along with the veterinarian, to offer assistance in the pending ordinance process. That's from an email he sent to all five of the commissioners dated January 11th of this year. On February 18th, I emailed Mr. Jacobson and requested the names of the breeders for 11 dogs which were previously referenced by him. He picked out the dogs. I wanted to know the breeders. That was, again, that email I sent to him looks like February 18th. Mr. Jacobson replied, and I'm quoting him verbatim here, I will gladly show you the names at the meeting. I prefer not to send you the names. That's not a misunderstanding or a misspeak. And I replied to him, by then, I will have limited ability, and this is verbatim, by then I will have limited ability to perform any due diligence or verify anything presented. You specifically asked me to reach out with questions, and this is the one and only question I've asked of you. Providing names at the meeting does nothing to protect those breeders, as you'd be releasing their names in an infinitely more public forum than you would by releasing them to me via email. As you're likely aware, the meetings are televised and available perhaps indefinitely on the internet. So he, he didn't provide those. Uh, we asked him when he came up here, and I guess he misspoke, as he said. I don't know how that's possible. It seemed very clear to me. BCSO, um, and thank you all to the, to the deputies who are here, uh, BCSO conducted a site visit to this gentleman's property on February 12th. So this is after the January 8th meeting. If anyone would expect they're under scrutiny, it would be right after it comes up before the county commission. So he knew of BOCC, so our concern at the time, and he knew that this item would be coming back to the commission as it is today. So on February 12th, as I alluded to, the sheriff's office conducted a visit to ensure compliance, uh, statutory compliance with record keeping provisions. Since Mr. Jacobson wasn't very willing to share his records in terms of where he obtains the dogs, I submitted a public records request to BCSO to provide me the information that they, they garnered in relation to that site visit. So, 
first thing to ask is source. Who's the source? I've heard, oh, my source, my source, my source, my source. I don't know what a source is. What's a source? I know what the source is now. We didn't hear it before, but I'll fill in the blanks where someone else is refusing to do that. And this is all from BCSO uh, during their site visit. So you can see at the top left, it's from Choice Puppies. That was a, uh, an entity which I guess was formerly the Hunt Corporation. Thank you. Uh, that was disposing of, of a thousand plus pounds of dead animal on, a, on an annual basis. And they were sending to, so there's no ambiguity, Puppies Plus on West New Haven in Melbourne. That's where that little arrow is going. So let's, let's talk about, about choice puppies before we get into anything here. I have the US, or a USDA report on choice puppies, and admittedly it's not the most current. Uh, and again, the, the problem is the names are redacted now, so I've, I've only got older records to rely on, but I, I think that they're very representative of, of concerns that I have and that I hope my, my fellow commissioners and colleagues up here share. Uh, I zoomed into that, that portion on the last page in this part. This is choice puppies, his source. Uh, there were concerns from the USDA about preventing the surface from being cleaned and sanitized properly with enclosures. And I'm going to read this second part just entirely. Two Japanese chin puppies were together in an enclosure in the bathing area. The floor of the enclosure was made of metal in a mesh pattern. The back leg of one of the puppies repeatedly fell through the floor opening to a point that most of the leg extended through the opening. The other puppy balanced on the mesh but appeared afraid to walk and would not move even when coaxed. Flooring that allows feet or legs to pass through can result in pain and injury to the dog. There's another concern they identified, again, with his source. Uh, same report, mind you. This isn't that I'm, I'm collecting 10 years of reports. Same, same document. Uh, they were apparently in the process of cleaning the enclosures while USDA was inspecting, and they were splashing water that the USDA was concerned contained fecal matter on the dogs. So they expressed their concern that it can contain fecal matter uh, and, and might contaminate the puppies. So let's see, how many puppies does Choice have or did they have at the time? Looks to me 343 is the total. That's a lot of dogs. That's not a mom and shop pup, uh, mom and shop a uh, mom-and-pop sort of shop, pardon me, tongue twister, um, that you might have been led to believe would be the case. So let's move on to the next logical question. Where does Choice obtain their puppies from? It's a good question, huh? I can't possibly go through all the breeders. Uh, I have pages and pages of info, but I, I want to look at one, and I did not pick the worst, and I did not pick the best. I picked one that I felt was representative. Let's look at it. So this particular one, and I, I may be mispronouncing the last name, it's Deborah Detters or Dieters, I'll go with Detters. And this is, again, from the BCSO public records request in February. This is not, this is not a, uh, a breeder that, that, that uh, Mr. Jacobson sourced a dog from 10 years ago. Well, he may have as well, but he certainly, certainly did with respect to dogs that were on premises in February. Let's look at some documents addressing Ms. Dieters. And again, I, I fully acknowledge these are old, old reports. Uh, but we don't have new reports because the names are redacted. So the state of Kansas inspected that individual who, again, Mr. Jacobson had dogs that he bought through a broker indirectly um, as recently as, as February, maybe more recently, I don't know. They noted feces buildup in the kennels, and they noticed that at least one dog had an infection. Another report on the same breeder talks about rusting in the enclosures and an opening in the cage where the dog's extremities could get caught. Same breeder. Dog found limping on the site. Same breeder. Rusting and unclean dog doors. Same breeder. ID number for dogs missing. So how do we track that? Mr. Jacobson doesn't even know who's inspecting him. Why do I say that? In an email to all five commissioners, which was dated February 22nd of this year, Mr. Jacobson stated that, quote, while we believe our kennels are the best designed for sanitary reasons, we are making an adjustment compromise to satisfy the county health inspector. In an attachment to that email, he states, quote, this recent, and he puts it in quotes, violation is a first, I think perhaps due to confusing our kennel flooring with wire cages. And he goes on to state, and again, I'm not paraphrasing, I'm directly quoting, and he wrote it in, in all caps, so I'll, I can't read it that way, but we owe no apologies to anyone as he blames the inspector for citing him rather than the underlying condition leading to the violation. Who actually cited him? Here's what I can tell you. We don't have a county inspector that goes and checks that. I checked with the state of Florida. They don't have inspectors that go and check that. So best I can tell, it's the USDA that he's telling us is the safeguard, and he doesn't buy puppies or, or source puppies uh, from groups that have USDA violations. Apparently, he may have one himself. Now, I want to go forward just to talk about 
A couple other things, and then I'll be done with the slideshow, and we can keep this thing moving. This is, is, this is a, uh, a document that was prepared in part by the USDA, and it talks about the requirements with respect to uh, flooring. And I'm going to read the pertinent part. Floors must be designed so that they prevent the dog's feet and legs from falling through spaces between slats and, or mesh. That's not the inspector's opinion. That's the USDA's opinion, and that's, that's absolutely consistent with what the applicable law is in the Code of Federal Regulations. So um, I hate to see someone making excuses when they, when they fail to abide by minimum standards. I'm going to give you all a quick summary. The AKC readily acknowledges that they do not endorse in any way pet stores and that they make no guarantee as to quality or the health of any animal. Secondly, the USDA inspection is largely meaningless. Objectively horrible breeders with a history of violations from state authorities and states where those inspections take place, and they don't everywhere, can and have passed USDA inspections. We've looked at at least one here. We cannot, most importantly, trust the industry to self-regulate. They've proven again and again that they do not and will not take humane care of the animals and that they'll lie or mislead at the very best to continue operating in a profit above welfare manner. So that's, that's my, my short slideshow here. It was longer, but I've cut it. Um, I apologize. I, just, I get worked up over this particular issue because it's, it's profoundly personal to me. Um, I, I will tell you, I have some grave concerns over exemptions with respect to this. Uh, what my hope is at this point is to have a conversation amongst the commissioners here to determine what they're willing to support, what their concerns are, to see if we can address the concerns. Um, I have, as I mentioned when I opened this item, I have expanded as much as I, I can possibly comfortably expand um, the protections afforded to hobby breeders so that instead of limiting them to breeding 20 dogs or, or I'm sorry, 20 puppies or kittens over the course of a year, we're now allowing 48. Truly anything over that, I think, is you're in puppy mill territory. I think 48 is, is quite frankly, a lot. But I don't want to hurt people that are legitimately doing a business where they're caring for the animals. And like the rescue groups, God bless you all that do that, uh, they're concerned about where the dogs are going to go, not about you know, whether you're going to pay by cash or check. You know, I can tell you when I adopted my dog, and I got them from Florida Little Dog Rescue, and I can tell you they've got a lot of little dogs. Um, I don't think they have very many big dogs with that particular group at all. Uh, they interviewed me. They made me come out with my wife. Uh, you know, they do, they do house inspections, and you know, thank God we didn't have anything crazy going on in the house. They were very, very thorough about making sure we could take care of the dog. They asked, I, I would say almost at the time, kind of intrusive questions about what I did for an occupation, what my wife did for an occupation, how often we're at home, what our work schedule would permit. You're not going to get that in a puppy store. You're just not, because they don't care about that. They don't care. They care about selling the dog and making a profit. That's what they care about. And maybe you'll have the odd outlier where that doesn't fit. But we've got, as I understand, and I, I invite Sheriff Ivey when he has a chance to come up after this to correct me, I think we have one pet shop in this county now. And we've heard from the individual, and I've addressed his breeders and his source. So we're not talking about good actors that we're going to be putting out of business. We're talking about people that run operations where either they're being dishonest or at the absolute most generous that I could possibly be. Their head's in the sand like an ostrich. That's the best. And I hope that's the case, because if it's not, it's, it's even worse than, than what I fear. So the, the question that we have and the concern that I have is by allowing hobby breeders, as are defined in that ordinance that I proposed, to sell to retail, we have absolutely no ability whatsoever, despite Sheriff Ivey's best intentions, and he's an excellent sheriff, and I'm, I'm proud that he's here and that he's helped with, with respect to this item. He can't fly to Kansas and, and go inspect them. If he flies to Kansas, that badge is worth its, its weight in, in, in toilet paper because it doesn't mean anything in Kansas. He can put me in a jail cell here, but he can't do anything to me in Kansas or Missouri. And every single one of the breeders that I've seen, without a singular exception, is from out of state. Every single one. I don't know of any exceptions. We've not had one hobby breeder come here today or in January and say, you're going to hurt me because I sell to retail. None of them do. Not one. The folks that are calling themselves hobby breeders are these folks that are out of state who, as we've heard, I believe, from Ms. Lazarell, will scratch through their USDA breeder number and write hobby breeder to make it more convenient to go hawk their puppies for a profit across state lines. So I, I'm hoping to have a, a conversation. I... At the beginning of this meeting, I had, um, obviously, we've got one proposed version uh, that's been included in the agenda packet where I, I think it's appropriate. I really do. I think it's, it's, it's very, very protective of the hobby breeders. We have another option that I've, I've made available to my colleagues during this meeting. 
that does build in more of an exception than the already existing hobby breeder exception that essentially would allow them to sell retail. But the reason that I asked the, the three folks that are the closest thing to experts that we have in this room about their concerns is because I am genuinely concerned that if we pass that, that may not do it. Um, I'm genuinely concerned that we will have folks who absolutely have a, a documented history of lying. They will continue along that same vein because we give them an incentive to do that, to continue making money. And we can, we can pat ourselves on the back and we can say, yeah, we did one for animals. We really, we really helped out animals. Well, in reality, we're not accomplishing a whole heck of a lot. Is it going to deter some bad actors? It's probably better than nothing. Uh, but in reality, I don't think it's going to get the job done. I'm very concerned. Uh, and the fact that we've not had a single hobby breeder show up here and say, you're going to put me out of business because I can't sell to retail, none of them do. None of them do. So I'm, I'm kind of hoping to solicit commentary from my colleagues up here, and I'll, I'll pick in the order they're sitting closest to me, where they're at with things. And I apologize for putting folks on the spot, but before I make a motion to approve something, I just need to know where my, my colleagues are on this. That's okay. I just, I had a request, and without centering them out, I had a request for a quick five, ten minute break. Only because we may be talking about this for a while, and we still have a longer agenda, and it's been a couple of hours since we last broke, so. I apologize, I'm long-winded. I, I don't mean to, to stop it, like, right in the middle of something, but if this goes on another 45 minutes, I don't want somebody dying. <laughs> okay. Okay, so we're just going to take a quick ten minute break. Thanks, guys. <laughs>